Well, thank you. That, that was the most extraordinary introduction I've ever heard. <laughs> Rate my professor. I've never read that before, but I, I, I'll have to find out who, who's made these comments. And well, on marriage, we, we all do marry up, don't we? That was certainly uh, my case. Um, well, thank you so much for coming tonight. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you to the organizers for putting on such an amazing event. Uh, this is the only one of two I know of in, in North America that is like this, where you combine intellectual rigor and uh, a sense of cultural and evangelical mission. So this is, this is something quite remarkable that you have here. And uh, I hope we can learn from you, as w when uh, Professor uh, Muller invited me six months ago, I said, well, okay, I, could, I can come, I guess, but only on the condition that you tell me about everything that goes into making a conference like this, because I hope someday that we can do something like this back in Canada. Um, now, my wife and I lived in the United States, and our, and our family did, for about seven years. I used to teach in the, on the East Coast uh, at Thomas More College. It's in New Hampshire. It's a lovely time. We have a number of children who are American. We, we, we love being in America whenever we can. Um, one of the things that uh, delights me about my encounters with Americans is they, they often have this prejudice. Now, you, you might not know it as a prejudice because you're, you're living here, but one of the prejudices, I'll call it, is that Americans think Canadians all know each other. <laughs> so for example, you, you, know, you find yourself in some elevator somewhere and you have a little chit chat and it comes out, oh, you're, 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 you're a Canadian, well, that's, that's lovely. Do you know Bob from Toronto? And the annoying thing is, usually we do. <laughs> it, it's, it's awful. Um, well, uh, this is the first time that I've come to your, your beautiful state. It's actually not unlike uh, the state, the province that I'm from, which is Saskatchewan. Uh, very, very flat, and then, it, and then it transitions to Alberta, where we live in, to, uh, live in now, which is a little bit more like uh, Denver, so it's flat, and then all of a sudden you hit the Rockies, and they're and they're gorgeous. But uh, so I, I think I probably have traveled the furthest today. I was up, I went to bed at 12 last night, and I got up at three for the plane. Uh, so I thought what I'd do is show you a picture of our what it's like back home. I, um, uh, Kieran, if you if you're able to put that one up, I'd like to put that up. So this was taken a couple days ago. <laughs> so our house is there. We've got the big red van, you know, with all the kids. Now my wife and I. We were at a conference the weekend before, at a homeschooling conference, and, and before we left for the conference, the kids had made a snow fort, and, and it, was, it was ridiculous. And then we left for two nights, and we came back, and then it was absurd. And, and that's, that's what greeted us uh, at, at the top. Um, so uh, we need to take up your theme here, which is, which is beautiful. And the question I'd like to start with is, in what ways can education help renew culture or help restore all things to Christ? This is what I'd like to ask. As Socrates said, philosophy is the art of dying well. Culture has a lot to do with death. Those who've tried to grow potatoes understand this. There's the seed, first of all. This is the fruit of last year's labor. It's got to sit in darkness, and it waits patiently. Then there's the good soil. If life is to come forth from it, earth requires a salad of death, in fact. Decayed leaves, a rabbit's droppings, skins from last month's onion soup, perhaps. That funny word culture comes from a Latin one, cultura, which is before anything else a word about fields and soil. Only by extension does it become something that points to hammers and arches and hockey and weddings and songs, and yes, education too. So I'd like to consider with you our conference theme through the lens of Christ's parable of the sower. And specifically, how it is that liberal education can help us renew culture and help us repair the depleted soil of our generation, which we find ourselves in. And there's one more picture here, if you don't mind putting to the, uh, going to the next one. Now, last spring, our eldest son, Peter, graduated from high school. Uh, he's the one with the, the red shirt on. This is just before he, uh, he actually went off to seminary. I work at beside a seminary, and, uh, and, and Peter's at that seminary. So this is the picture we took. Half the family was, was somewhere else at that moment. Uh, so those, those were the ones of us here. And uh, we, were, we were taking him in his, in his drive off to college to drop him off. 
20 minutes away from home at the seminary. And this was, uh, so this, for me, this is a kind of a precious moment, I guess. Peter was homeschooled, and then he attempted, uh, attended a thing called Campion Classical Academy. This is a two-day-a-week program that a couple of us families started. It has 40 high school students. It's linked to our larger homeschool co-op. Campion has a crest. Students wear a uniform, and children study a range of subjects like Latin, literature, physics, traditional dance, sacred music, gym. They sing for mass. They put on an annual, uh, a, a big Shakespeare production at the end of the spring. And once or twice a, twice a month in the evenings, they do things like sing carols around the neighborhood, as they did a couple of months ago for Christmas, or have board games and parties together, or meet in a literature circle like they did last night, which is why I was up till 12. <laughs> now, by modern standards, Peter received a decent classical education. Yet, his launch into the adult world, I'm not sure whether, if you can hear the buzz, but if, if there's something I should do, let me know. But his launch into the adult world caused me some sadness. I was sad to see him leave our dinner table. We only now have four teenage boys at our dinner table. <laughs> I was sad to leave him, see him leave. Uh, but there was another cause for my sadness. His departure helped me to see all the places where I'd failed in his education. Hunting, for example. Sure, we'd killed a few things, and he'd seen a lot of blood on his brother's noses <laughs> over the years. But where we live, moose literally walk up to your front door, as they did this time last year. And we never killed one, <laughs> or a deer, or hardly any fish. Then there was Greek. By grade 12, the farthest we'd traveled in the New Testament was through a few phrases and the alphabet. Ars longa vita brevis, say the Romans. Art is what? Life is short and art takes a long time to master. You might not get a chance to do it. My wife and I have, have a number of children, so it's likely we're going to have, if God gives us time, a few more years to experiment. So that's fun. And maybe we'll do better with the next ones. But... I have been wondering, given the state of our culture, did Peter's education equip him well enough? Well, I suppose that all depends on what you think education is for. Culture, cultura, designates a common way of life. That's the 20th century historian Christopher Dawson's simple notion of the complex experience of geometry uh, geography, economy, architecture, marriage, government, poetry, music, play, and war. A common way of life. But the rough element in all of this, the dark earth that holds together the sand and soil of memory and institutions, that's called religio. Now, the medieval grammarians, they gave this gloss on that word. They said, Religio comes from religere, to bind or to hold together. So Christian culture is not the same thing as Christian religion. There's a distinction. And yet, it's only through the medium of culture, as Dawson once observed, that the faith can penetrate a civilization. End quote. So thinking about my son's Peter, my, my son Peter's graduation has prompted me to consider what our contemporary soil is like. How do we, our children, our students, our young adult, your young Peters and Marys, how do they experience being bound today within Canada or Alberta or the United States or the state of Kansas? Whatever else it may be, it's quite unlike what I experienced 30 years ago and very much unlike what their grandparents experienced 30 years before that. If you'll indulge me, I'd like to ask you to sit and stand in just a minute to help illustrate something of the speed by which the composition of our common soil has changed. Some of you here are students. If you are, could you raise your hand? You can define yourself. All right, if everyone else could take a look at them, take a look at a few faces. 
Now imagine, as you look at these young people, imagine what their grandparents looked like, what grandma and grandpa felt and saw, and how they experienced being one in 20 a little while ago. Okay, would you mind all standing just for a moment? In 1960, so let's, let's all stand. Yeah, er everyone, if you can all stand. Sorry, not just the students. Okay, 1960, imagine that we represent the totality of the United States of America, the, the population. In 1960, America was self-reflexively Christian. When you asked the religio of Americans at that time, about 92% said they were either Catholic or Protestant. And 2% said that they were none. Now, I've, uh, I've planted uh, a few people. Are you here? <laughs> Okay, could everyone else sit down except for those two or three people? And I'd like you two or three people to point at us. Are you here? I can't see you. Mr. Vaughn, are you here? And yell, hey you, you're odd. That's even more effective than I wanted. <laughs> okay, well, could we have one student, could we have two students who are sitting there? You two ladies, I see you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, now you, you point at us and say, hey, you, you're odd. Thank you. You may be seated. <laughs> Over the next 40 years, the quality of religio in our culture shifted, though changes were felt more on the inside than observed on the outside of our institutions. Between 1960 and 2000 for Catholics, feminism, individualism, consumerism, Oprah Winfrey, and a sociology of self-affirmation altered how we understood and felt Catholic identity, religio, that sense of being bound. All the while on the outside, our institutions looked mostly the same. So the same Gothic arches greeted you when you, when you entered the same Catholic colleges. And the same nuns lingered, if no longer in the hallways, at least in the memories of our schools and hospitals in 2000. Church attendance was falling, but still respectable. Catholics remained proud of their church, and most Americans still waved their flag. This was about to change. Since the millennium, the change has sped up. By the turn of the century, nuns had now, N-O-N-E-S, had risen to 10%. Then Facebook launched in 2004, then the iPhone, then scandals in the church grew, then America's role as leader abroad became less secure, and divisions here at home widened. Today, one out of four Americans now tick that nun box. These are people trapped within what the Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor has called the so-called imminent horizon. How about us within the church? I'm going to get you to stand again in just a moment. How many Catholics here remain sacramentally alive? According to CARA Research, it's a, it's a think tank in, in D.C., about 20% of Catholics and 13% of young Catholics attend Mass weekly. 20 and 13. So let's all stand again, if you don't mind. This is the last time, I promise. Let's consider ourselves as signifying or representing the total grade 12 Catholic population in the country. Okay? That's who we represent. How many of us go to Mass weekly? About, we just said, 13%. Now, if I did my math correctly, that would mean everyone else should sit down except for the two inner rows right here. So if everyone could sit down except for this row and this row and this row and this row. So you're, you're going to stand two rows and you're going to stand two rows. Perfect, beautiful, thank you. Just for a moment. Who are these people? These are... These are our elite kids. These are your homeschoolers. These are the kids at the Chesterton Academies. These are the kids at the, uh, at the parochial schools that are alive and vivified to their mission. These are the leaders in CCD. These are your altar boys. These are those who love what they're doing. They love their faith and they're practicing it. You're our hope. Now, what happens when they go to university? According to at least one study, and this is, this is now an estimate, this is not a perfect number, but studies suggest that 
If we take this 13%, okay, so you are the elite among all the grade 12 Catholics, within 18, 16 months, two years, seven out of 10 of this group is going to stop going to church. So let's count quickly. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So all, except for the back three rows, everyone else can sit down. Now, last thing. I'd like every one of us point your finger at them, and now we yell at them, hey you, you're odd, go for it. Thank you, maybe may be seated. Give them a round of applause. Can you feel the difference in religio between grandparents and grandchildren? Yeah. During the era of grandparents, you could barely hear that seventh in accord. You could barely hear that uh, demure over there. Now, to be religious is to be pointed out and to feel awkward if you're the kind of person that feels awkward. <laughs> Some of you like it. <laughs> you live for being pointed out. If religio is what keeps together the soil of culture, it's no wonder that ours feels like it's beginning to crumble apart. Having stated something of what's missing in our culture, I'd like now to consider a few ways that liberal education can help heal it. And I'd like to look at some of the benefits, some of these benefits, through the lens of Christ's parable of the sower. You remember that parable. A sower scatters seed upon three different types of earth. Three are depleted. One is ready to receive the word and multiplies to a great degree. After Jesus delivers the parable, though, his disciples pull him aside. They don't understand the significance. And here is how Christ begins his explanation. Could you take out now your handout? And we're going to read together out loud Citation number two. This is Jesus beginning his explanation. If you could read with me. Hear then the parable of the sower. This is what was sown on the path. The problem is the word of God bears no fruit. The seed is thrown, the devil snatches it. What's the wound? When truth drops into this young man, young lady's lap, it simply rolls to the ground. Because why? Christ says they do not understand. Man, by the old definition, is rational. But he's also animal. That means our intellect is fragile. And the aboriginal aim of liberal learning is to make it a little less fragile. One sign that the formation is stuck, says Aristotle, and on the parts of animals, is that an educated person will tell the difference between a good argument and a bad one, a likely tale, and a fool's fancy. Now, the student, especially you know, for those of us who have been students for a while, or we've been with students for a long time, you know that you don't need to live on the peaks of wisdom to know this difference between a likely argument and a likely tale. You need only at some point to have snatched a view of things from above the tree line. And one sure road to this ascent is the practice of the art of definition. A point is that which has no part. Line is breadthless length. An equilateral triangle is that which has three sides equal. For most of the West centuries, Euclid's elements provided the model for clear definition. It is a steep climb. Those who make it find there is pleasure in mental clarity. There is necessity in it too. Arguments come from syllogisms, syllogisms from propositions, and propositions from terms clearly understood and defined. Words are meant to act like windows, not like dirty glass. They're meant to help us see things and name things as they really are, not to draw attention to themselves. This naming exercise expresses what logicians call the first act of the mind. Disciplines like the quadrivium, those are the mathematical arts, 
no less than the trivium, the linguistic ones, they can't take flight without it. Restoring a habit of expressing clear definitions and of seeing and naming things for what they are would surely offer some repair to our culture's depleted soil. Consider the consequences of keeping our soil hard. How often have we been led unaware down the devil's path because we failed in the accurate use of terms? Think of the switch, for example, from baby to fetus. George Orwell's 1984 gives one image of how a state can force you to lie, but guns and boots are only one method. Soft forms of mental coercion can be worse. Appeals at baculum, no less than appeals at misericordium, can corrupt and confuse. I'd like to offer an illustration of the second kind of corrupting appeal from my own country. In 2015, the Supreme Court in Canada, in Carter v. Canada, mandated our euthanasia regime. Have you heard of it? In a bewildering display of verbal gymnastics, the justices discovered within Section 7 of our country's, country's Charter of Rights and Freedoms how the right to life, liberty, the security of the person entailed nothing less than a doctor's public duty to kill. The justices argued in the following three steps. Step one, some sick people will kill themselves to avoid suffering. Step two, in the absence of a doctor's promise to kill, some people will kill themselves before their own strength wanes, hence shortening their lives. Step three, in the presence of a doctor's promise to kill, some people will delay the moment of suicide, hence lengthening their lives. Did you follow that? From the Constitution's right to life, the justices squeezed out a doctor's duty to kill. The syllogism rests, of course, on a shabby equivocation. By using that term life to cover different meanings, the prestige of a principle of natural justice is transferred to a utilitarian cost-benefit analysis concerning the delay of a suicide. But of course, the principal defense of life is not the same thing as a calculated delay of murder. And yet, we miss that difference. Well-intentioned people in my country now promote death in the name of life, autonomy, and most of all, compassion. Ad misericordiam. How could you be so cruel not to kill? Soft words have become hard weapons. And of course, words have become weapons not only in Canada. Our contemporaries use the language of the gospel, compassion, integrity, equality, diversity, exclusion, to undermine the gospel. For too many of our sons and daughters, once they leave home and step into the winds of the adult world, or merely when they scroll along their Instagram account, Somehow the habit of definition vanishes. Like Daedalus's statues in the Mino. In, in our current mental environment, definitions we thought were tied down, like male, female, seem to get up and wander away. Now, a liberal education might not launch another great awakening, but Restoring a habit of demanding clear definitions would probably save your child from becoming woke and would surely repair something of our culture's depleted hard soil. Next is the rocky soil. What's the problem here? Let's read together. This is citation number three. Together. As for what was sown on rocky ground... That 
person immediately falls away. Matthew 13. When persecution hits, that person literally trips. Scandalitzitai. Scandalitzitai. You know that word. Scandalon. St. Paul uses it in 1 Corinthians when he says, Christ's suffering is a scandalon, a stumbling block to the Jews who wanted a Messiah who would not suffer. Scandalon is originally a hunting term. It names the part of a trap where bait is attached like the hook at the end of a fishing wire. So the scandalon is the snag, the thing that grabs the bird. According to Christ, the snag, the snare for this soul is suffering. How might a liberal education help that? During the Second World War, there was a, uh, an, an educated woman, a young woman named Simone Vai, who had a correspondence with a French Dominican priest about her spiritual and cultural questions. In 1942, she wrote to Father Paris a letter in the form of an essay that she thought might help his students approach their study in a Christian spirit. And the essay is titled, Reflections on the Right Use of School Studies with a View to the Love of God. Has anyone ever come across that? Some of you have, yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a minor classic in these circles in the 20th century. It, it's a 20 minute read and well worth it. At one point she reflects on the value of studying Latin and she takes the, form, the formation of Jean Vianney as her test case. Now, as a seminarian, you have to remember, Vianney couldn't remember his declensions. Is that a, or is it conjugations? <laughs> I don't know. A mo, a mass, a mat, and after that it just fell apart. And try as he might, he couldn't pass the stupid exam. In the old days, those Latin teachers were not to be <laughs> disregarded. Only after repeated fails was the future patron priest passed along for holy orders. Now, I actually don't like to tell this story to my seminarian students because they take advantage of me when it comes to this. They become all mystical when it comes to exam time. <laughs> Vi asked, were these hours of study wasted? Possibly, but not if offered in the right spirit. Vi proposes that the key to a Christian approach to study is the recognition that prayer consists of attention. Prayer consists of attention. In the spiritual order, quality counts for more than quantity. On the value of Latin in particular, she continues. This is citation number four. I'll read it, it's okay. Even if our efforts of attention seem for years to be producing no result, one day a light which is in exact proportion to them will flood the soul. Every effort adds a little gold to a treasure which no power on earth can take away. The useless efforts made by the cure for long and painful years in his attempt to learn Latin bore fruit in the marvelous discernment which enabled him to see the very soul of his penitents behind their words and even their silences. Wouldn't it be nice to have a confessor like that? <laughs> No, <laughs> some of you have one. <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit scary. I, 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 have, uh, I, have, a, uh, I have a bishop who's my, uh, is a retired bishop, a very holy man, uh, who's uh, I'm privileged to have as my confessor. And I don't know if he quite has this preternatural gift, but I do, I do sometimes pause when I go into confession and think, okay, hang on now. <laughs> Am I being honest? Because he's very honest. And I think God tells him things about me. Well, Jean Vianney had this great gift, and Simone Vai thinks it came from the study of Latin. Along similar lines, Joseph Ratzinger once reflected on the effect that a classical curriculum had upon the young of his day. In 1937, four years after Hitler became Chancellor of the Weimar Republic, the 10-year-old Ratzinger had entered his program of classical studies, which is equivalent to an English grammar school or maybe the Chesterton Academy. 
During these years, he witnessed the dissolution of the classical curriculum into a decidedly modern one, a curriculum focused on practical subjects, suited directly to the economic and political progress of the state. Later on, as cardinal, he judged that the mental habits instilled by the study of Greek and Latin helped people resist the totalitarian regime's program. This is citation four. Sorry, five. You can follow with your eyes. In the meantime, national socialism had not yet been able to change any more in the Traunstein Gymnasium than it had in my school in Askau. Not one of the professors of classical studies who belonged to the old guard had joined the party, despite the considerable pressure exerted on government employees. Soon after I arrived at the gymnasium, the second headmaster was removed and from his post, and he did not bend to the new masters. In retrospect, it seemed to me that an education in Greek and Latin antiquity created a mental attitude that resisted seduction by a totalitarian ideology. I grew up Mennonite, and occasionally I slip into Plautdeutsch. I always thought my, my grandma, my Oma, one of my Omas, and um, Ratzinger were basically the same age, and they died basically the same time. And I've always uh, thought they they uh, sh shared a same similar kind of spree de corps, uh, a, a real mental toughness and and humility. Okay, he goes on. It says, within a year of my arrival in the gymnasium, an emphatic reform began. Until then, the humanistic gymnasium and the scientific school, so you don't have this, this is just me, had existed side by side as two separate institutions. Now they became, became blended into a new school in which the study of Greek completely disappeared and Latin greatly diminished. Now, modern languages, especially English, and the natural sciences instead received much greater weight. With the new type of school also came a new younger generation of teachers, among whom one could certainly find many with excellent talents, but many who were now decided supporters of the new regime. Three years later, religious instruction was banned, with its place taken by physical education and sport. End quote. What, what do you think when you hear that? What stirs in your heart? Not all of us here in this room are classical education Greek geeks. I was going to say Greeks. <laughs> <laughs> Slip. Some of you, some of you uh, are unfamiliar with the lingo of classical education. Some of you are rightly wondering, is this, is this a fetish? Do all schools really need to be classical schools? Is it elitist? Those are very good questions and objections. And there certainly are some ways of construing classical education that I think don't really line up with the tradition. They, they look and feel a little bit more like a fetish. You know, you just happen to love uh, antique Roman coins. <laughs> Does that mean we all have to like antique Roman coins? <laughs> Probably not. I don't think that's the view that Ratzinger has, though. I don't think it's a fetish. So it raises the question, well, what, what is essential to a classical curriculum? And what are parts of a classical, classical curriculum that are mm, accidental to time and place? A classical curriculum is typically more demanding intellectually than a, a modern one. But that's not the specific difference. Yes, logic can instill clarity. Yes, history can instill gratitude. Yes, Greek tragedy can instill nobility. Yes, church fathers can instill faith. But not even these goods mark the specific difference. The difference is that these two curricula aim, so Vi and Ratzinger suggest, at different final ends. At different final ends. Where the modern curriculum aims at the perfection of the state, 
The classical one aims at the perfection of man, the human, as human, homo. And man is made for more than the state. So much for the repair of the rocky soil. Let's look at the last. Could we read together? This is citation number six. As for what was sown, and the lure of wealth, and it yields nothing. I'd like here to focus on two words. Two words, care and world, of the world. On cares. Christ's teaching is not that an active life hinders the gospel. Groceries need to be bought. The young need to marry. Children need to practice piano. Roads need to be built. And on and on and on. God likes it. The world is his idea, as are our bodies. The word for care, merimna, has buried in its etymology a notion of division. And so if you extend that to the mental activity, mental division, mental distraction, care, too much care, you're distracted, think Martha. Other term, on the world. Uh, there's there's a, the phrase behind it too, eunos, can be somewhat misleading in the English translations. It, it also has something to do with different manuscript traditions. But Slightly better than the RSV is the Dewey Ream, care of this world, and even the NIV, which I don't normally like so much, worries of this life. I think that's the best. Jerome has solicitudo sequeli istius, the care of this age, care of this age. Secular, seculum, is not bad. Remember, a secular priest, what's that? Diocesan, someone who's not, in other words, in the monastery, cloistered, but rather has the smell, as Pope Francis said. Yes, the smell of the sheep. It's a nice image. You've got to be friends with people that you minister to. Side note, the, 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 um, at the college I'm, I, I serve at, the, the, one of the branches of work that I'm devoted on right now is research, or that we're pr promoting, is research on vocations in Canada. Re re uh, vocations to the priesthood in particular. Um, <clears throat> well, one of, there was a study that came out in the US that we had our eye on, very interesting, a few months ago it came out, and, and one of the questions it asked was, okay, hang on, if we break down the demographics, or, or that is to say the, the population size of various dioceses from the biggest, so I think that's 750,000 plus Catholics, down to the smallest, which was, if I remember, around 100,000 Catholics. Then the question was, <clears throat> are there any, can we any notice, uh, notice any differences in the vocation patterns between these groupings? of dioceses, so the very big to the very small. Yes, we can. Here's what they found. They found that, and uh, I, th I think I'm, if I'm not exactly correct, I'm very close. The smallest dioceses, they produce priests at a rate of six, six times more proportionally than the mega dioceses. Huh. And it's not only because these dioceses happen to be in the Midwest in Kansas. <laughs> Although there might be something to that too. I think this is what our Lord is getting at. That is to say, the world... Okay, I'm losing my track here, sorry. The, the point of all that was to say that secular is not bad. Secular is good. And hence, the association, a secular priest, is a priest who's invested in the world, knows his parishioners, or parishioners, uh, his parishioners. Um, <clears throat> there's a, there's a, 
there's a, a beautiful form of secularity that all of us, including the clergy, are called to. We're called to imbue the secular world, imbue the temporal affairs of this life with the spirit of the gospel. So the world is not bad, secular is not bad. The point is, it's penultimate. The problem with such cares of the world is not that they are unreal, the problem is that they can grow disproportionate and elongated out of shape like your shadow at sunset. When we're overly attracted to the cares of the world, our attention becomes divided and we momentarily forget ourselves, our ends, and the differences between first things and second things. That's the problem of the thorns that Christ is speaking to. And this is always unhelpful. I'm going to offer an example from aviation. Here it goes. On a winter morning in 1985, China Airlines Flight 006 was 10 hours into an 11-hour trip across the Pacific, headed to, to Los Angeles. At 41,000 feet, engine four of the Benj uh, uh, Boeing 747 died. I was thinking about this as I was flying here today. <laughs> the plane's speed decreased. The loss of one engine produced asymmetrical thrust. You know, think of that, it's got four engines, one is down, the other keep going, so your plane begins to turn, right? asymmetrical pushing the craft to a roll on the right. When the autopilot was still engaged, the pilot turned his attention to the first officer's efforts at restoring the engine. Now, to me, that seems plainly straightforward. <laughs> Buddy, let's get that thing going. But that's not actually what he should have done. Any of you a pilot? Standard procedure calls for a different course. What he should have done is taken the plane down beneath 30,000 feet manually, and then tried to have a restart at that point. But he didn't because he was distracted. Time was lost, and with the loss of thrust and the autopilot still compensating, the unnoticed roll now became a problem. After finding the restart, restart impossible, finally, and apparently focusing only on speed, the pilot now did take control and now began the descent. By this time, though, the angle of the plane was acute. The, 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 the crew began to mistrust the instruments. Things were going wrong quickly, and they essentially disregarded everything they were seeing in front of them because they thought they'd all died. The plane now enters into a mass of clouds, and once the view clears again, to the crew's dismay, they'd fallen into a nosedive at about 11,000 feet. Now, to my understanding, a loss of one engine on such a plane at such an altitude is not considered an emergency. But the incident quickly turned into a near disaster because of the pilot's break in attention. That one initial poor decision led him to focus on what was secondary to the detriment of what was primary. And instead of keeping his eye on several things that were within his purview and his responsibility, he came, became focused on other people's responsibility. You want to know how it ended? I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> it's pretty interesting. <laughs> My point is that we are all that pilot. Facebook, Instagram, the social media platform formerly known as Twitter, the 24-hour news cycle places each one of us in that cockpit because there is always a crisis somewhere. How many times have we had our eyeballs glued onto the wrong instruments? How many hours have we given over to scrolling, given over to anger? How many opportunities to pay attention to friends and parents and children and students have we lost because we were paying attention to politicians and athletes and your... American singer Taylor Swift. <laughs> I just found out about her recently. <laughs> I, get, I have the, I'm part of these, well, I give these, uh, I lead these apologetics talks once, uh, once a month. They're really fun. Big group of students who do all kinds of crazy, good things. And, um, and so about once a month, I try to learn something about popular culture. <laughs> 
So two months ago, it was Taylor Swift. Now, I, I don't ever look at things, uh, if I have any doubt, question, I, I'd never look at something without my wife sitting beside me because it's, it's, it's dangerous. Things can blow up in you. I, I could only handle about five minutes on her website, and I thought, oh, this is unbelievable. I just put it away. Um, I had heard of Taylor Swift about 10 years before, actually, but I sort of consciousness and, but anyways, I had this younger colleague that told me, Taylor Swift is really popular now. Okay, so, I, so anyways, that's Taylor Swift. Who's the other guy I learned about? Oh yeah, Andrew Tate. Know about him? <laughs> that was last month. Um, also very interesting. Um, fantastic in some ways. These are the cares of the world, politicians, athletes, dot, dot. These are the cares of the world that threaten to choke out the good seed of the kingdom. So how can liberal education help us avoid nosediving to the Pacific or in Christ's image, avoiding the thistles all around us? The benefit I think liberal education can offer to this last type of person, and I'll be much quicker here, is in the healing of their desire, of our desire. And this healing is a work of literature in the fine arts, of beauty. That kind of healing needs to start early, before the thistles have had time to set in. Ennobling passion begins, says Plato, with music and gymnastics, poetry and sport. Within the classical curriculum here, notice this, sport integrates body and will. That's why you should have sports teams. Otherwise, they're a distraction to your mission. Sorry. If they're not integrated into what you're trying to do as an institution, why do you have them? And if you do have them, make the best use of them possible. They're meant to integrate the body and the will so that you're not a sop when persecution comes. What is poetry meant to do? Poetry is meant to integrate duty with desire so that the good becomes not only an obligation, but a joy. Poetry in particular includes the memorizing of proverbs, fables, dance, the singing of silly songs, rounds, the Kyrie and the Sanctus of the Mass, reading aloud Winnie the Pooh, Treasure Island, Narnia, and generally what, now I teased you once, let me praise you, your Kansas professor John Sr. called an emergent in the imaginative world of the 1,000 good books. Let me sum up where we've landed thus far. Thus far, we've sketched how representative features of a classical curriculum can heal our cu culture and contribute to restoring all things, maybe only indirectly, all things in Christ. The healing I've described is the healing of the hard soil, the rocky soil, and the thorny soil. That's in the terms of the parable. Or, in the terms that Plato gives, this would be the healing of reason, of will, and desire. In our remaining few minutes, I'd like to end by offering a couple of book recommendations. Or at least recommendations that a classical teacher might make to someone wanting to build up their good soil. And then I'd also like to raise very briefly one objection. On books. And Christ says, but as, what, as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields. So on books, if you wanted to yield good fruit. The hard soil signifies the man whose reason lacks wisdom. Most of us, like Dante, somewhere along life's journey, awake to find ourselves in that dark wood, Inferno Canto 1, tempted to despair. Hmm. Yet, as Virgil might have said, dum spiro spero, while I, <laughs> while I breathe, I hope. Remember, he was the guide for Dante, all the way up until Beatrice took his hand. 
The intellect is no fuzzy screen. The mind is ordered to the real. If your friend needs to cultivate wisdom, you might recommend to him St. Thomas's Five Ways, or Newman's Idea of the University, or Chesterton's GK, <laughs> Chesterton's Orthodoxy. Next, the rocky soil signifies the man whose will lacks fortitude. If your friend needs to cultivate fortitude, you might recommend to him Aristotle's Ethics, or Walter Chiswick's harrowing tale with God in Russia, or C.S. Lewis's screw taped letters, or any number of beautiful collections of saints' lives. We read them at, in our own house. We, we have a breakfast takes a long time because it's when you have the captive audience. You know? So this is, this is, I don't know, probably half of our education uh, takes place when people are eating their porridge. <laughs> so we, we sing, we, uh, we sing certain things, memorize certain things. Oh, read Proverbs, as in um, Proverbs from around the world over, over, over time. Uh, those are delightful. Uh, and we also, oh yeah, and we also read a hagiography. Now my wife and I, my wife is sanguine, and I married a sanguine. Uh, we're always looking for the saint that doesn't suffer. <laughs> Do you know of any? <laughs> we're converts, hey? We're, we're still new. <laughs> Maybe if you find a better book, we're still on the lookout. <laughs> the thorny soil signifies the man whose desires lack order. If your friend needs to cultivate temperance and justice, you might rec recommend to him Plato's Symposium, The Ladder of Love, or Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice, which shows desire and love joined by virtue. Or Stephen Leacock's Sunshine Sketches, it's one of my favorite Canadian books. Actually, this is for Dale Equist. According to the Oxford uh, Companion to Literature, I believe, 1967 edition, Stephen Leacock was the most popular writer in the English-speaking world in the decade of the 1930s. That beats Chesterton. <laughs> <laughs> you don't believe me, do you? <laughs> That's OK. Sunshine sketches. It's, it's hilarious. It's witty. Or Therese of Lisieux's story of a soul. Or the best medicine might be to get out of school and get a job. Why? Because learning to wake up on time is no small feat. An objection. Is all of this too impractical? Shouldn't we be content to get students merely to be college and career ready? As one of your Department of Education documents had it. In reply, I might echo what Cardinal Newman said in reply to John Locke on this question. Newman said, one, that general culture of mind is the best aid to professional and scientific study. General culture of, mi culture of mind is the best aid to professional and scientific study. Reason one. Reason two, he said, that liberally educated men and women can do what the uneducated cannot. In other words, though utility is not its first aim, this sort of education will produce more thoughtful, more just, more wise doctors, lawyers, politicians, entrepreneurs, electricians, athletes, priests, and homemakers and nuns. And besides, aren't we made for more than work? I mean, this gig's up till when? When are we done? Nine? You still have two hours. Or if you're a student, four hours. <laughs> what are you going to spend your time on? After material me needs are met, what? And that's a question neither John Locke, nor Karl Marx, nor John Dewey, nor Paulo Freire, nor any of the other architects of modern education, and modern education was developed 
to try to get rid of classical education. It's not neutral. That's a fallacy. They don't say much about it. Once a modernly educated person is done accumulating cash or agitating for the next election cycle, they tend to get bored. To these moderns, the time after work and after revolution is simply empty space. We moderns tend to think that we should fill it with, do you know the word? Entertainment. Activities that merely please. For us who are trapped within this imminent horizon, once our physical desires are satisfied, our souls tend to become agitated, restless, uncomfortable with silence, lacking joy in spiritual things. This is the condition that St. Thomas Aquinas calls assidia, sloth. Instead of entertainment, Classical educators encourage us to speak as Joseph Pieper does so well in his little book of leisure. That is, what joins the pleasurable with the good. A good education should fit us for leisure, and good leisure will free us from sloth. I have all along used the term classical education. I think we're now ready to define it. By classical or liberal education, we refer to that formation which seeks to perfect man as man. In our tradition until recently, it was the common form of learning. Beginning with the Greeks perfected by medieval Christians, it produced what Newman termed true enlargement of mind, or what C.S. Lewis called old western man. It promoted an integ integrated vision of knowledge, foundational skills, broad sympathies, Usefulness, humility, and magnanimity. Where classical education, where classical education aims, can you hear me? At understanding nature so that we might imitate it and perfect it, modern education aims at understanding nature so that we might control it. Where the classical aim is at seeing things as they are so that we might love them, the modern aims at making things as we wish so that we might use them. Where the classical aims at perfecting man as man, the modern aims at perfecting man as citizen. Where the classical aims at contemplation, the modern aims at action. In short, where the modern binds us to time, the classical inclines us to eternity. Amen. In conclusion, having thus far praised its capacities to repair the soil of our culture, we do well to name a couple of its limits. Is this the only formation we need? No. There's much more to learn than liberal education. Before 10, the young learn best by imitation. After 20, the young adult should be turning towards specialization. In between is the humanizing years of the arts. Should everyone go to college? No. Elements of liberal learning should be offered to all, but not all need to go into debt pursuing it. Does education guarantee salvation? No. Salvation requires knowledge, but it requires more than knowledge. Christianity's central image is a crucifix, not a wizard's book. Will liberal arts make us safe? No again. A nation needs more than words and numbers if it's to defend itself. Will liberal arts make us rich? Maybe. <laughs> but that's not the point. So, if not salvation, if not security, if not wealth, what does a classical liberal education provide? Only good soil. Thank you very much.
not good yet. There we are. Good. Okay, we have time for <laughs> two questions. <laughs> Of course, somebody in the very middle. <laughs> da, da, da. Thank you for being here. Um, welcome to Atchison. Um, I had a question about uh, your own experience uh, in being educated. Um, what, what was that like? What was your education like? And how did that influence the choices you made in educating your own children and also your endeavors in educating other people's children, improving education in general? Okay, thank you. That's a generous question. My education was mostly bad, and everything I've tried to do is mostly by way of negative example. <laughs> it's true. When I was in high school, I... Um, what I was interested in was not school, and I, uh, so I, I devoted myself to sports and would be in the weight room during physics or engineering classes. Now, I, I, had, no, I had a few, I had a number of people uh, that were wonderfully inspiring, and they did plant a seed in me, in my own personal life, as they did in others, to uh, to, to, to think and hope that there might be more than the kind of industrial formation that I was receiving. Not everything that I was given was bad. I had many good teachers and, and wonderful formative experiences, but I certainly didn't have anything approximating, uh, or, or rather, I'd say, in my own life, so I grew up when, I'm, I'm 46, so I grew up in the 80s and in the 90s, and there were still threads of, at least where I'm from, uh, threads of uh, this classical vision around where I grew up, went to some Catholic schools, some non. Um, but there's certainly no sense of an ordered whole. So I think from, uh, from my wife and I, like, like many people of this generation, of our generation and, and now your generation, uh, the, the work of this time is really a, a work of reconstruction, uh, of, of remembering past habits, of remembering things that our grandparents used to know and our parents used to know, but they, they weren't passed on in, in any kind of uh, holistic or, or complete package, or, or at least rarely were they passed on that way. This is why it seems to me that the, one of the chief works, though not the only works, of a teacher is always, to, is always to help people fall in love with beautiful things. Because if you can help people fall in love, then they go do the rest. Right? Of course, you have to still give exams and all the rest of it. But love comes first. And so in my, in my own life, uh, yeah, I, I, had a, I had a couple teachers that did help me to fall in love. So by the time I was in grade 12, I had a bit of an intellectual conversion when I was in, uh, I was a summer missionary, actually, in uh, my later high school years. And I was going around as Protestant, and I would uh, lead Bible camps for little kids. And uh, so I'd be staying with these different host families in small town Saskatchewan, which is a little bit like small town Kansas or Missouri, uh, from what I understand. And, um, but I had these, I had, I had a book, uh, a philosophical book, and it, at, in, at night, I, I, was, I, was, I had nothing to do, really, and, uh, and so I was able to read some philosophy, and this, this fired up my soul. So by the time I was in grade 12, I knew that I wanted to devote myself to, to, to studying the good, the true, and the beautiful. Anyways, thanks for that question. It's a generous one. One more question. Um, thank you so much for your talk. I yes. really appreciated it. A question that I had was, this sounds lovely and beautiful for children that are coming out of homes like yours. Um, what do you do when you have children, or what are your thoughts on kids at later stages, you know, maybe entering a high school, say, and they've had no experience of this, their only experience is public education. Mm -hmm. You're trying to run a solid, you know, Catholic high school. W what's your advice? What's your advice for that? Oh, that's, yeah, it's a great question. So the, the advice would be something like, you, Aristotle's, if you boil Aristotle's advice on education down to a simple line, this is what it is. It says, begin with the known and then move to the unknown. So it's no problem. It doesn't, doesn't matter. You, you begin wherever someone is at. You find the right conditions for them, because that matters. 
and then you, you, you take them for where they are and you, you do your best to draw them up this ladder of beauty and this ladder of love. Uh, a classical education is not elitist in, in the sense that people often cast aspersions against it. It's realist. It's realist in the sense that it takes human nature seriously for all our bumps and warts and bruises. So there's no fantasy. You don't have to think that, oh, it's only for smart kids or only for kids who happen to have an integrated home. One out of two of, of our young people now, so th this is an American stat, uh, one out of two teenagers in the United States now, or fewer than, uh, live with both parents, right? So our, our culture is, is a, you know, manifestly, our culture is one which has depleted soil. So, so classical education now is going to look very different from what, what it would have or could have looked like, uh, let's say, 75 years ago. Classical education in 50 years or 20 years is probably going to look different as a movement than it will now. Right? As, as more people are working on these projects from different points of view, more pockets, more families, more dioceses will, will, are, are taking on this, this movement, recognizing that modern education is not neutral. That's just an absolute fallacy. It's deliberately constructed to undermine and destroy Catholicism in particular. Okay? That, that's just a historical fact. It's not an opinion. So the key difference, again, I would say is, oh, what's your end? What are you shooting for? Are you simply shooting to make someone useful and productive for a cap late capitalist society? Well, that, that's important. You should be useful. Okay? But, but you're more than useful for society because you have a higher end, and that's eternal. Okay, thank you.